it almost feels like we are starting to turn away from DEI. Are we? And if so, why? I think there's two things happening. I think one is that many of these roles were never set up for success. The infrastructure wasn't there. They were figurehead roles. So I think there's that piece. But I also think we need to remind people of the business case. Right now in the U.S., 40% of individuals identify as non-white. That number is rapidly changing. Procter & Gamble tells us there's over $5 trillion of spending power with the multicultural consumer. That doesn't include individuals with disabilities, veterans, the LGBTQ plus community, and more. And if you actually don't have those voices and talent in your organization looking for those market opportunities, I don't know how you expect to stay competitively successful. Because if you're sitting here in the U.S. right now and you're saying, I have no growth to be had, I'll challenge you to say, who are you serving and who are you overlooking? Who are you ignoring? Mita Malik is the head of inclusion, equity, and impact at the financial software company, Carta. She previously worked with leading iconic brands like Avino, Avon, Chapstick, Vaseline, Suave, and Dove, ensuring that Black and brown people were represented in advertising campaigns. Thanks to Mita, Vaseline signed actress Viola Davis as a healing project ambassador for the skincare brand. Mita is a Wall Street Journal and USA Today bestselling author, co-host of Brown Table Talk podcast, and a contributing writer for Harvard Business Review, Adweek, and Entrepreneur Media. Mita, welcome to Voices of HR. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I have been waiting for this conversation. Oh. I think ever since we maybe signed you up over a month ago, because you are all over social media. I love following you. I oh, love thank you. what you're serving up. But one of the big questions, and we have a lot of big questions for you sure. today. One of the big questions that we want to start with is DE&I. Mm. So we have read that upwards of 30% of CEOs have reduced, significantly reduced their funding for DE&I. We have seen that 100%, almost 100% of heads of diversity, equity, inclusion at some of the largest organizations have turned over. And it almost feels like we are starting to turn away from DE&I. Are we? And if so, why? Well, I'm going to continue to do this work. So I'm going to say it's important now more than ever. You know, people will either say it's the best time or the worst time to write a book on inclusion. I think there's no more of an important time. And I'm doing this work for my children and all of our children. And when my children ask me, what did I do during this time? I want to say that I showed up for an impact. I think there's two things happening. I think one is that many of these roles were never set up for success. The infrastructure wasn't there. They were figurehead roles. I'm not going to come into your organization with a wand and fix this. Mm -hmm. It's not how it works. Budget, resources, appropriate titling, all of those things, right? So I think there's that piece. But I also think we need to remind people of the business case. Now, I was at a conference recently. I was on stage and someone said, we don't want to hear the case anymore for Mm -hmm. diversity. And I said, I'm going to give you the business case as I think it repeats bearing. Mm -hmm. Right now in the US, 40% of individuals identify as non-white. That number is rapidly changing. Mm -hmm. You then have Procter & Gamble, which is just one source that tells us there's over $5 trillion of spending power with the multicultural consumer. That doesn't include individuals with disabilities, veterans, the LGBTQ plus community, and more. So you think about all the different dimensions of diversity that we can be serving. And if you actually don't have those voices and talent in your organization looking for those market opportunities, I don't know how you expect to stay competitively uh, successful, like how you have that competitive advantage. So that's why I think it bears repeating. Because if you're sitting here in the US right now and you're saying, I have no growth to be had, I'll challenge you to say, who are you serving and who are you overlooking? Who are you ignoring? Because so you, that's why, yeah, that's why I think it's now more important than ever. Well, because, it, you know, leaders can ignore or turn away from DEI within sure. their own organizations, but you can't stop the change 
and the shift that's occurring yes. outside your organization. Absolutely. You can. And so then you start to think of what talent do you want to attract, mm-hmm. right? The, the pendulum will swing. It always swings mm-hmm. as soon it as does. the employee has power. You know this. But yeah. you, know, you look at the marketplace right now and you have companies like a Basecamp and a Coinbase. And if you've heard of those tech companies, famously during the pandemic, they came out and said, we don't want to talk about social justice issues employees cannot have a DEI committee all of these things one of those companies in the week they announced they allowed people to leave if they wanted 30% of employees left mm. so what that is reminding us is that as soon as i have the vote and the choice of where i want to work i will decide to work for a company that reflects my values and so you will see basecamp Coinbase, yeah, there will be companies like that. And then you might see Patagonia and Ben and Jerry's. You'll see companies plotted all along the line mm-hmm. of where they want to stand or not stand when it comes to inclusion work. Well, and I think the exclamation point on that statement is Sam Altman. Yes. And what just happened and exactly. how a majority, and we're talking maybe a handful of people who didn't sign mm-hmm. a letter to the board that said, employees who wrote a letter to the board and said, we want Sam back. Absolutely. And he returned because you cannot run a company without employees. The employees are the company. People (laughs) seem to forget that. And listen, I say this all the time. Employees are your forgotten consumer. Mm -hmm. They're one of the most important and powerful stakeholders. We're all selling something. And we're all so obsessed with the external marketplace. And you start to think about, wow, the employees, like imagine if in that situation, the employees had had a vote Mm -hmm. or were actually asked if that was, that's interesting before they made that decision, that story might've played out differently for the company and the marketplace. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I love that they used their voice. Yes. And I think this is just telling of what's to come with Gen Z Mm -hmm. as well. Absolutely. They don't see things through color. They want to see things as equity and they want to see inclusion. They expect inclusion. And so I, I think the the workplace is changing so rapidly that leaders aren't keeping up. And yeah. so to your point, you have made so many excellent points in your book, which I absolutely oh, love, by you. the way. And I know it's a bestseller, so we don't thank need to you. plug it here. But if you <laughs> haven't read it yet, Go buy it. Please (laughs) do. Go buy it. (laughs) Thank you. Um, It was published by Wiley, which is a world-renowned publisher. So congratulations on that as well. So if the company isn't willing to realize that the consumer base is changing, that it doesn't really matter what your talent looks like, you just want to attract talent. And that talent can be black, that can be brown, it can be blonde, it can be dark haired. Um, But if you aren't willing to change the culture within your workplace, you're probably not going to attract top talent Mm -hmm. and you're not going to retain them because you have insight on what's actually happening within workplaces today. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about that? So one of the things when I talk to leaders, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, justice. I mean, there's some words I've missed. And I always come back to like, what is inclusion? Inclusion is that I work for you, I feel valued, I feel seen, I feel recognized, my voice matters, my contribution matters, because let's be clear, I've been invited to many meetings where my voice didn't matter. And I work for you because I want a paycheck, but I also have found my purpose and I want to make impact. And how horrible is it to be at work every day and feel like you don't matter? Nobody cares what you're doing, people are stealing your ideas, you're not included to meetings you're being dismissed, you're being minimized, you're being talked over. And so imagine the loss of productivity, Mm -hmm. like the loss of productivity and what that does to you. And the other thing I share with leaders and anyone listening is you hired me to contribute a hundred percent, my talent and genius, my expertise. Now imagine if I come into work and on top of the fact that maybe no one cares what I'm working on, people are also making comments about my hair, how I look, How did you get rid of your accent? How do you speak English so well? Your lunch smells funny. You're taking up too much space. You're not taking enough space. You get what I'm saying. I'm actually not operating at 100%. I'm operating at 50 to 75% on any given day. Mm -hmm. And so you're not unlocking my potential. So I'm not helping unlock the company's potential. So for me, inclusion is really about productivity and loss of productivity. Mm -hmm. It makes me so sad to think about, well, we're hiring all these great people, 
but they don't feel like they can actually do the job they were hired to do. And so that's another perspective for leaders listening when you think about why does, why does inclusion matter? Mm -hmm. And then you have, if you take it one step further and you look at some cultures within organizations, mm -hmm. it, it starts with bias, but then it turns into microaggressions mm -hmm. or it turns into what my book is talk, talking about targeting, bullying, and abusing Yes, women and people of color. Mm -hmm. You also have tackled that topic. Yeah. So tell our listeners a little bit about what you have found in your research and what you wrote about in your book about microaggressions. Well, this myth is around one of the myths in my book is we protect the a-holes. The businesses wouldn't run without them. Our business wouldn't run without them. How many times have you heard that? You've probably heard that a few times. Oh, please. Before, and yeah. you've written about it in your own book as well. But it's, oh gosh, I just... The human psychology around this, I just don't understand. Like, mm -hmm. Mita, I work for you. And I'm, let's say, you're the CEO and I'm the CMO. And I've had five women of color leave the team in the last mm -hmm. 10 days. Mm -hmm. It's a revolving door. Nobody wants to talk about it. No, nobody except you, the CEO, because you mm -hmm. are just convinced that the business won't run without me because I've done such a good job of managing up to you. And I've that's convinced right. you that I'm the one doing all the work when it's the team that's doing the work. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I go back to the this idea of the employee being the forgotten consumer. We don't spend any, not to say any, but there's a lot more time we could spend on exit interview data. And rather than you confronting and saying, actually, it's Mita that's the problem, you're asking recruiting to continue to fill all these seats on my team. And you will go to such great lengths. You will actually risk the company's reputation, your own personal reputation to keep on this toxic bully. And I've seen leader after leader do it. And it has to do with human behavior of you and I might have a relationship. You trust me. You don't believe that I could do any of these things mm -hmm. to hurt and harm other people, but you will tolerate me hurt, hurting and harming a lot of people and keep me around and let other people leave. Over it's so and over true. Again. And I love that you were so candid in your book and really spoke the truth mm, because these individuals, as you just said, are really good at managing up. Mm. Yes. And so what leaders should actually do is take a very close look at themselves mm. and how they have been manipulated yes, to I believe that they have actually contributed something superior or better for the organization sure. when they're actually doing the opposite. Oof. Ouch. Ouch. Ouch right? is right. Mm -hmm. It's a truth. It's a truth. And, you know, our listeners are HR. Mm -hmm. And I think HR has one of the most difficult jobs absolutely, in organizations today because they see it. They're sitting there, they're, they're getting the complaints. They're receiving the complaints from the top performers who are getting the microaggressions or on the receiving end of that, and their hands are tied. So how can we help yes. the HR pros that are listening today? Uh, that's Give a great question. Tips. You know, some of the things I've done in my career is to say, you and I are sitting down. You kn we know that meat is the problem, right? Meat is the problem. So- have you thought about a succession plan for Mita? I know you think highly of her. Maybe this can be the year that Mita moves on. What, what would it take to do that? What are your concerns? Who could backfill her? So start to actually create the plan. And to say, we could message it as, Mita had an amazing five years here. She's now going to be the CMO of this other company. That's a customer that we work with. So making it easier for the leader. There are some cases, and I'm not general counsel, so I don't want to go into the legal space, but you can actually ask individuals to get therapy and help. You know, executive coaching is weaponized mm -hmm. far too often. Mm -hmm. If I am hurting people, it's because I'm hurt mm -hmm. and I need the time to go heal. And so that is not going to happen through executive coaching. Mm -hmm. I, need, I need a different level of help. And so there is opportunities perhaps that I move on to get therapy and I come back after doing that sabbatical mm -hmm. and really showing people that I've changed and I'm going to do better and be better. Mm -hmm. So there's all kinds of different options. I also think 
you know, reminding people of the data and some of the insights. I don't know how often people are actually going through their exit interview data mm -hmm. to say, okay, let's actually look at this last year, how many people actually left me this team, and here are some of the things they had to say mm -hmm. about working in our organization. Have you actually heard all of it? Maybe you actually haven't, right? Maybe you've heard whispers here or there, but for someone to come with a complete, as complete as they can story of what's happening might also be a way, a powerful tool. I would say data insights and then the power of storytelling, pulling that all together mm -hmm. for you as a leader to help you hopefully make the right decision to help me move on. So speaking of storytelling, I know that you have lots of stories and yes. stories from your book. What one do you end up either telling the most or thinking about the most when you're having these types of conversations? Mm. Well, I will say one of the ones that I, I have been pleasantly surprised by the feedback. I, I say that I'm saying all the quiet parts out loud in this book, but this story that I shared, which you might remember, why are you asking for a raise? You and your husband make more than enough money. It really gets to the heart of what's happening in our companies around pay and equity, which I know we're all as a country uh, globally chasing. And I know that there are so many HR leaders listening who are doing the right thing with mm -hmm. legal, with outside counsel, quietly behind the scenes. They're doing pay equity reviews. Most employees don't know it. Right. They are looking right. at the gaps. But here's the thing. It is me, the individual leader who comes in with my bias and wreaks havoc on the system, right? Because mm -hmm. you find out what my husband does for a living and you decide to pay me less. True story. Mm -hmm. And these things are happening over and over again. And it's really tied to the role we believe culturally in our homes and film and media. We expect women to play versus men and they show up at work. Mita carries a Birkin bag to work. Okay. I don't have a Birkin bag, but I'm just doing this for illustration. But Mita, car can, yeah. Mita, carries a Birkin <laughs> Mita carries a Birkin bag to work. She doesn't need this job. Why are you giving her a 5% right. raise? Mita's the primary breadwinner. In her family, she doesn't need a retention bonus. She's not going anywhere. Or I have been in talent reviews and pay reviews where conversations like, well, I know you're giving me a 10% increase, but did you know her husband, Jim, is in sales and he's killing it? He's going to get a great commission. Mm -hmm. You can move that down to 5%. You're like, what? Mm -hmm. And this is the bias that True we story. comes up, right? You mm -hmm. heard story after story after story. Right. And you know, I don't have the privilege to wear a hoodie at work. But then I don't have the privilege sometimes if I wear my nicest logo bags and nicest shoes and my nice place, assumptions are being made. Well, how can she afford that? She doesn't need this job. And I always joke, it's like, you know, if my husband wore the nicest suit and the nicest watch, he'd just attract money, right? Yes. And so yes. I really want leaders to think about their own bias and uncomfortability about money, which many of us have, and how that shows up when we're paying people. And that's the one where I'm like, you know, how do we really get to tackling the pay gap? I think it has a lot to do with individual leaders mm -hmm. and how they wreak havoc on the system. If I also asked you out of the 13, yes. which I love that you used the number 13, is there it's a story behind number. that? It's what my is lucky it? number. That's it's it. It's your lucky number. Yeah. June 13th is my birthday. So that's it. That's the science. It's just my lucky number. There you go. I actually thought there was more to it. but <laughs> No, I'm like, my son what? asked me the other day too, mom, why'd you pick 13? I said, it's my lucky number. That's all. <laughs> I love it. So out of the 13. Yes. Top two myths. Top two myths. Well, I already favorite. gave one away, but the other one. Now you're asking me, oof, this is a tough question. You're asking me to pick between my kids. They do this to me every day. <laughs> Who's your favorite? Um, mm, I, I'm all for diverse talent as long as they're good. I'll say mm. that again. I'm all for diverse talent as long as they're good. Have we ever heard anyone say, I'm all for non-diverse talent as long as they're good? So why is it that when someone like myself shows up on an interview slate or is up for an internal promotion, all of a sudden you feel like the bar has been lowered because you perceive something different about me. And so I ask leaders to really think about that. Oftentimes we create our own challenges with the pipeline myth and cultural fit, right? All the things that I talk about in that part of reimagined inclusion. And then the next myth, another one that I've been talking a lot about lately, or people have been asking me is, 
we're not apologizing. They need to stop being so sensitive. And so this idea of people are being sensitive, that didn't happen. I'm not apologizing, or you can apologize for me. Or it's like when my husband says, I'm sorry I made you feel that way. That's the right. non apology, right? <laughs> and so not I not accepted, I, not accepted. And I mm -hmm. wish that. My hope is that more leaders will have humility in the workplace because we're not superhumans. We're not gods. We're all going to make mistakes. And if you can own the mistake, own the apology, show up and do better and be better, your relationship probably will be better and stronger than it was before the incident occurred. And that's not just for individuals. It's also for brands, just as we said. Companies mm -hmm. aren't just companies. They're made up of people. <laughs> And so it also yeah. goes for companies that are making mistakes in the marketplace and how they show up, similar to what you just talked about with Sam Altman. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I almost wonder, too, if it appears the C-suites that I talk to have sea legs. They don't know which way to turn. Mm -hmm. They've been told one thing in the media, then experts like you are coming in and saying, okay, here, here's another way to think about sure. it. And it's not going away. So you do want to continue to address it. So are you seeing that type of confusion as well? I am. And you know what the confusion is? I do think it's leadership, pre-social media and post-social media. Social mm -hmm. media has changed the world in the last 10 to 15 years and continues mm -hmm. to change. So you know, one of the things I talk about in Reimagine Inclusion is a, 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 a communications leader who would say, do nothing, say something, it'll blow over. Yeah, maybe 15 years ago, but now guess what? We all have a microphone. Mm -hmm. I can get on X or LinkedIn or Instagram mm -hmm. or TikTok, and I can share my feelings about a company that I feel has hurt or harmed me. Mm -hmm. And those are the things that gain traction and become viral. So why can't we just accept, as I talk about in Reimagine Inclusion, okay, this ad was racist. We're sorry. Mm -hmm. You're sorry, and here's what we learned from it. Mm -hmm. And here's where we're going to show up and do better. So I think those two things are colliding because I they think are. there are some people who still believe, don't say anything, it's going to blow over. Right. And then there are other people who recognize at some point, these communities we've built, mm -hmm. companies and brands, mm -hmm. we don't own them. They belong mm -hmm. to all of us and they have equal voice and they have the power of their wallet. They vote with their wallet and they're going to be loud about how they feel. They're not just going to go away quietly, nor should they. I agree. And it's it's one of those things of transparency. Yes. And then I always think about those leadership teams who are not living their values mm -hmm. and what they're promising, whether it's a value proposition, their brand, sure. whatever it is, it's now being seen by everyone. It is. It is. And it's a risk that organizations are taking on and they don't even know it. Absolutely. They have to figure it out. And so I think HR is part of the key Absolutely. of helping them figure it out. So what tips would you have, maybe a top two, would you have for HR to start having these meaningful conversations and really position themselves as the expert to come to the big table and say, we can't ignore this. We still have to do something. And here's what we should do. Mm. Any tips or tools? Having a pulse on your organization, the heartbeat of your organization. Just as I did as a marketer, I spent a lot of time with consumers. Yeah. How can you come up with a product that's going to delight and surprise or enhance the quality of someone's life if you don't study them? Same thing with employees, whether it's employee advisory council, whether it's your people survey quarterly, annually, whatever you're doing, you're going to ask people for insights and really study mm -hmm. what they're telling you and what you're seeing. And I do think more and more as you've seen the people function, human resources evolve, data and the insights is so important. So being able to gather the insight data and then being able to tell a story around the insights is going to showcase you with deep expertise and a trusted partner. I it's think that's so, so important. True. And I think also many of us, as we should be, are focused inwardly. We're helping our company, we're helping mm -hmm. our leaders, but really having a view on the external marketplace. Like if we keep going back to what happened to the CEO mm -hmm. whose employees said, hey, we want him back. 
you're like, wow. So actually reminding people you're going into a meeting in 2024. Hey, these were the big five stories of last year where we saw the empower of employees. And so that also positions you with deep expertise because you're also watching to see what's happened in industry, out of industry, competitors, three to five things that you've seen other companies struggle with. Why should we repeat the same mistakes if we're watching other people have gone through them? We can say we can avoid this because we're learning live in the marketplace how this turned out. This can turn out differently for us. That is brilliant. No one has said that on this podcast thus far. So go out HR and look for the top I stories. do that all the time and people love it because you know what? Mm -hmm. Everyone cares about what competition's doing in the external oh, marketplace. Absolutely. So use that to your advantage. Absolutely. Absolutely. Are there any organizations either that you've worked with or that you want to work with um, that are getting it right? Hmm. I love that question because we can mm -hmm. spend a lot of time on people getting it wrong and we all yes. get it wrong and we get it right. It's a journey. There's no destination. But I'm a beauty obsessive, as you may know. My husband's the foodie, but I'm all about beauty products. I do love community and conversation, but oh, I've sold a lot of beauty products in my life. And I'm a bit obsessed with Sephora. Mm -hmm. And they've been on a real journey and I include them in reimagined inclusion too. But they had a racist in-store incident they were accused of several years ago. And again, we talk about that mistake that was made mm -hmm. and how they rebounded since then. Mm -hmm. And the amount of things, every, every time I open my social media feed, I feel like they're up to something else. And one of the things that they did after this in-store incident, they brought people through training. Okay, you'll say, yeah, mm -hmm. other companies have done that. I've heard that before. But they did something really interesting. They commissioned the first ever study that studied racial bias in retail. Wow. And then they took the result of the study and then decided to actually action some of that for their own stores, mm -hmm. you know, really upskilling beauty advisors versus hiring more third-party security, all sorts of interesting things. They started an accelerator program. So they started to realize they have a responsibility to get more black and brown founders on shelf and in store. Mm -hmm. Really amazing. So they're helping companies start products and services and coaching them through it. And then they actually took that study. I'm going to fast forward. They did a lot of other stuff. Mm -hmm. They took that study and then decided, we don't want to hold on to this ourselves. We're going to actually partner with a nonprofit. We're going to start a pledge. We're going to have J. Crew, Banana Republic. We're going to have other retailers come and sign this commitment to actually really try to interrupt bias mm -hmm. in retail. And that is how you change Mm -hmm. an industry. You start to say, hey, I'm Sephora and I have a bigger responsibility than just to Sephora and my holding company. I actually want to invite my competitors wow. to sign this pledge. And so that's what I really encourage listeners to think about. What is your company doing, but what could you be doing? And wow, isn't that kind of bold to say, I'm going to mm -hmm. actually partner with competitors, but that's how change, made, change is made. And I think there are a lot of HR leaders listening who could be in a position to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, I love that story because they learned from a mm. mistake, right? They had sea legs. They didn't quite know what they were doing and they figured it out. And then they went to your point and helped other retail outlets also progress yes. with DE&I and I inclusion. Incredible story. Incredible story. So as you think about reimagining inclusion, and you think about DEI 2024, 2025. Mm -hmm. What do you wish companies would do differently? I wish they would treat this as an important business function and build it through everything they do. And so, what do I mean by that? Four pillars I'll go through workforce. Of course, we want the places and spaces where we operate our companies to reflect those communities throughout entry level to board. I understand that. But have we thought about some of our people processes, performance improvement plans, who's deemed a poor performer and not, who gets more chances and not? Have we thought about all those things? Talent calibration, right? I mean, recruiting is important, of course, how you attract talent. But how about how you develop and promote talent? Are we doing that fairly and equitably? The second we talked about is brands, products, and services, that pillar. No longer can you ignore how your brand shows up in the marketplace. 
How are you thinking about that? And like I said, ask yourself, who, who are you not serving and why? What community have you completely overlooked? The third is really around supplier diversity. I think a lot about, listen, I worked for a many Fortune 10 company where we wrote the same several million dollar check to the same <laughs> supplier. Mm -hmm. And you start to think about the power of the dollar and how many small business owners can you be supporting? I, I mean, we're really proud at Carta. If we can be someone's first customer, that can be game changing for them mm -hmm. to say that they have Carta on their website. It's huge. And then the last piece we talked about, I mean, values, you can say you're ready to stand for them, but when are you ready to stand up for them? And it's a really difficult time right now mm -hmm. to be in the people space, people function. It's a difficult time to be leading. Employees continue to, to demand so much of their employers. Mm -hmm. And so really having a perspective on that is important. What can we expect from Mita oh. a year or two from now? A year or Another two from book? now. I would like to write another book. Yes, I have a few more books in me. So yes. I love it. And listen, the backlash against diversity, equity, and inclusion is real right now. Mm -hmm. I'm, my, my book will get banned in Florida or Texas. I haven't gotten news of that yet, <laughs> but it probably will. And so you think about- Okay, Roe I'm not laughing, but I'm but it's, laughing. But you can because, laugh or you can cry. I understand. Right, I mean, you know, right. Roe v. Wade was overturned a year At and a half ago. At the ridiculousness. Affirmative yeah. action, right? And so I'm going to continue to- do this work. I hope you'll all join me. And I keep saying this, but there's no more important work to do now than this. There really mm -hmm. isn't. And when future generations ask us, what do we do during mm -hmm. this time? What does the you perfect workplace look like to you? The perfect workplace. Mm -hmm. I'll go back to how we started. Perfect workplace is that like, I'm excited to go to work every day. I don't have the Sunday scaries. I know that people care about the contribution I'm making. We have to go back to why we go to work. We go to work to make impact. Some of us go to work to find purpose. Some of us are going to get paid. But, you know, this idea of being respected for what you do, that's what it comes down to, right? And nobody wants to be somewhere every day where they're devalued. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants Completely that. Completely agree. Completely agree. And you can add value. It doesn't matter if you're male or female or brown or black. That's the future of talent is identifying talent Absolutely. regardless. Okay. So we are nearing the end of our regular schedule podcast, but we do something at the end called rapid fire questions. Oh, so okay. these are one sentence questions with one sentence answers. So one the sentence audience only? Gets, okay. Well, you know, All some right, people so it's okay. two or three. So okay. you know, whatever you want to do. Rapid fire questions. Are you ready to play? Okay. Yeah. I'm sitting down. Let's do All it. All right. All right. Let's do it. These are easy for you. What are bad recommendations you hear in HR being passed off as best practices? Really more about feedback. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep killing it. No, please provide people feedback that's meaningful. I've worked with too many leaders where I'm just like, I wish you had gotten that feedback 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Your career might have turned out differently. So true. What is a book besides your own? that's greatly influenced your life or career? Recently, I read a book called The Anxious Achiever. My mm -hmm. friend Maura wrote it. And wow, I am haunted by the following question. Has it been ambition or anxiety that has driven me most of my career? Wow. Okay. That's on the next read list. What's uh, something everybody in your industry should stop or start doing? Start getting to know people who have different lived experiences other than your own. Step out of your own community. What do you wish everybody understood about your job? What gets measured gets done, right? What gets measured gets done. It's like anything we do in business. What is one of the best or most worthwhile investments you've ever made in your career? And it could be an investment of money, time, or energy. Working with my coach, DC Marshall, who's now my podcast co-host, Brown Table Talk. Finding a coach where you have a real clear goal that you're going after. That's been one of the best investments of time and money. What's a tangible next step that listeners can take back to their business based mm -hmm. upon our conversation today? I want everyone to go back to work tomorrow and think about 
can you be the reason that someone feels included at work tomorrow? We're all busy, worried about ourselves. We should be. But like, is there somebody on your team who seems disengaged, who seems more quiet, who seems less, less excited about work? What's going on with them? How can you help out? I want to see more of us intervene in our workplaces. We spend too much time at work not to. Where can people go to learn more about you? LinkedIn, Instagram. You can check out my new book on Amazon, Reimagine Inclusion, Debunking 13 Myths to Transform Your Workplace, or you can go to your local bookstore. Go buy it. It is a fantastic book by Wiley. Today, we have been joined by Mita Malik, Head of Inclusion, Equity, and Impact at Carta. Thank you again for joining me, Mita. It has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. Thanks so much for watching. We would love it if you shared your thoughts on any of the topics we discussed in the comments below. And if you got value from the video, it would mean the world to us if you hit the like button and subscribe to the HR Morning channel. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next time on Voices of HR.